Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatrist Podcast, a place for inspiration, insight, and information on holistic mental health. Join your host, Dr. Alice Lee, and discover critical information on safe, effective psychiatric medication withdrawal. Explore new ideas that enlighten and expand the mind with cutting-edge authors and experts, along with former patients as they share their miraculous healing journeys. It's time to build your well-being from the thought up. It's time for the Holistic Psychiatrist Podcast. Here's your host, Dr. Alice Lee. Hello and welcome to the Holistic Psychiatrist Podcast, where we are building well-being from the thought up. I'm your host, Dr. Alice Lee, the holistic psychiatrist practicing in New York and Utah. For more information about me and access to free articles, podcasts, and contact information, please check out my website, holisticpsychiatrist.com. And thank you so much for listening today. Today, we're going to talk about a topic called trauma resolution therapy from a holistic psychiatrist whom I have been friends with for a long time. His name is Dr. Michael Gurevich. And uh, he is a board certified uh, psychiatrist. Uh, he is a certified acupuncturist. I'm really grateful for Dr. Gervich for coming uh, onto my podcast and sharing his valuable time. He is a very holistically minded psychiatrist. He's board certified in psychiatry, addiction psychiatry. He's a certified acupuncturist. His expertise uh, encompasses various integrative treatment modalities, uh, particularly for complex psychiatric cases unresponsive to conventional medicine. Uh, notably, he has developed methods for weaning patients off psychotropic medications. That's why we've known each other for a long time, and I've referred many people to Dr. Gurevich who uh, had access to his care. So welcome, Dr. Gurevich, for being on this podcast. I'm really glad that you're here. Okay, Alice, thank you very much for inviting, and uh, and I enjoyed our fr- friendship for a long time. Mm-hmm. Had a chance to learn from you a lot, and uh, and, I, and and you are brilliant in what you do. Oh, thank you. And on a couple of occasions, I had a chance to cover for your patients, which was an interesting experience. Oh, well, we'll have to talk about that after the podcast. <laughs> I'm curious what, what what's interesting about it. There are not too many psychiatrists who call themselves holistically minded psychiatrists. So, so I guess we are kind of brother and sister. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Aspect. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. Um, so I would love to, you know, start off by asking you to introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, tell them a little bit about yourself and your background and whatever you're happy to share. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I emigrated from Lithuania in 1982 and then was uh, lucky to pass my boards. Uh, I'm sorry, was lucky to get the, to get the exams to, and basically got into a field of psychiatry. Mm-hmm. And I thought I found myself and I was very happy in my residence. I get some fellowship time. And, but then when I began working uh, in my private practice, very soon I learned that my patients are not getting better. Mm. And that was a big, big blow to my ego and to, to everything what I expected uh, from doing the work. So I began to explore what else is there. As a fans, the first thing what came, uh, what came at that time, that was uh, early, early nineties, uh, uh, it was uh, auricular acupuncture, ear acupuncture. And that was the first thing that I learned that there is some other form of medicine to help people who are suffering from all kinds of issues. And at the time, I was taking care of substance abuse patients on a psychiatric unit and on an outpatient unit, and they keep relapsing. You know, I would do everything what I know about. I pass my board, but they keep relapsing no matter what. Mm. So that was a big, big kind of tool for me. And so, 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 and, and, and because things were not going well with my conventional medicine, I, I burn out and I began to look what else is there. And it was amazing how many, many different 
treatments are there, how many different helpers are there, which is beyond psychiatric field. And then uh, my, my goal was to integrate it. And, uh, and I was at one point going to so many, uh, <laughs> to so many retreats and, uh, and meetings that my wife uh, threatened to divorce me. So, oh my so goodness. Slow it down. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, I know I, that you're a very intellectually curious, uh, doctor who's very, very open to other people's work. I know that. Uh, back in the early, I think in the around 2005 or six is when we first met because you were very curious about what I was doing as a holistic psychiatrist in Maryland. You traveled right. all the way to my practice to learn about some of the energy testing methods that I was doing at that time. So you're definitely combing every corner of the country trying to figure out how to be a better doctor uh, at that time. You know, so I, I really respect you for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. At that time, there were not so many people who were really in this field. Integrative psychiatry was very, very rare. So I was eager to see what you were doing and kind of uh, observing you in what you do was quite amazing. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Oh, thank you. And, uh, and one of the mentors that I met, uh, Dietrich Klinhardt, he was a, a German trained physician who kind of uh, developed this field of uh, integrative uh, biological medicine, who was practicing teaching it here in the United States. So actually, I learned a lot from him. And one of the methods, so we may talk a little bit about it, was uh, neural therapy is an injections of local anesthetics. And that is to help to balance autonomic nervous system. And at the time I didn't know it. Uh, so first of all, this method uh, has been around for about uh, clo now close to 100 years. Uh, but later on, I found out that, that uh, applying it to psychiatry was contraindicated in this method. But unfortunately, I learned it too late. By that time, I already was doing it for about five, six years. So, so I knew that it works and works wonderful. And uh, so I began to do more and more integration. One of the injection there is uh, called stellate ganglion injection. It's in the neck. There is this uh, uh, ganglia or nerve block, which is controls everything uh, above our diaphragm. And that's a main place where people kind of hold their emotions. And actually, this particular injection is done by anesthesiologists and uh, who know nothing about psychiatry, know nothing about uh, muscle testing. So they kind of randomly do it either right side or left side. They were getting reasonably good results. So, uh, so, so that's what kind of, that was a big opening for me how to integrate this injection. And then I learn about some other injections, how to integrate it and how to be able to help uh, people to resolve their issues. Mm -hmm. Well, I know I and maybe some of the people listening to the podcast will have questions about the differences between what you're using in terms of injections and as an anesthetic and what uh, is kind of popular nowadays with uh, ketamine uh, infusions and things like that. So it's also an anesthetic. And I just wondered uh, what you use as an injection and how is it different from the other forms of, you know, treatment right now using anesthetic based substances. Right. Right. So I use ketamine as well. It called I use it a form of that called ketamine assisted, uh, assisted psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And that basically consists of, uh, on the first meeting, given, uh, giving people injection into their, um, shoulder, for example, and then, uh, giving a relatively small dose of this general anesthetic, which put them into alternate state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
And when people in the state of consciousness, they can access the information, their traumas that they may not even be aware of. And then uh, under, let's say, my guidance, and I would talk to them asking what's happening, how they're doing. There is a whole process how to prepare for the meeting and how to conduct it. And it helps them to resolve some of the issues. And then usually with that, I follow it, uh, giving them uh, opportunity to do it at home two to three times a week, consulting them. That's a very good method as well. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, neural therapy, the way I do it and the way most uh, uh, neural therapists do it is with a short acting local anesthetic called procaine or novocaine. And this method actually uh, pretty widely used in German, uh, Spanish-speaking countries. It was uh, developed uh, around early 1920s, in, uh, kind of at the same time in Russia and Germany. And kind of each country has its own name, but they're essentially doing the same thing. And this method was applied to a conditions which are kind of which conventional medicine failed to cure. And the method allows to resolve a number of difficult physical conditions. And applying it to psychiatry, we may talk about it. It's a, it's a, it's a very effective tool. And I can explain, you know, why it's so. What I understand is that because so many patients weren't being helped, they were relapsing even on medications that you learned how to use, despite all of the board certifications and training that you had, you went on a huge journey of searching for other answers for your patients, which is really admirable. And you came across this method that you found extremely effective for those patients that you worked with and helping them overcome traumas. Now, I think one thing that might be helpful for those who don't understand the connection between trauma and like serious mental illness is very helpful for you to explain because I believe in my journey in, in looking at holistic medicine that these traumas really do have a very strong physiological or biochemical effect on the body and the neurotransmitters. But I wanted to have you share your insight about how trauma resolution can then be connected to maybe psychiatric resolution or how does it improve um, the psychiatric condition of patients that made you so excited about that method versus what you were taught, which is psychopharmacology? Yeah. So, so psychopharmacology, I'm still using for those very difficult patients. And of course, uh, I'm using it when people come to me on five, seven, eight medications. So you cannot stop them right away. Of course. It's a, it's a very, it's a very slow process, kind of getting them well. Then you can gradually, gradually uh, decrease medications one at a time. Mm -hmm. And many people kind of take a chance. They stop their medications right away. They go into withdrawal. They get into hospitals. All kind of uh, difficult. So I need to discipline them. Mm -hmm. Wait until you get well, and then it would be no issue to get you off medications. I and believe I that. Yeah, yeah, and that's what that's what we do. So basically, early in my life as a psychiatrist, when I learn about acupuncture, I learn about this additional system of communication that our body has, which is energetic system which which we know that acupuncture meridians or those channels that that carry this energy and this energy carries extremely fast from one place to another and this energy is helping us to be connected on multiple levels so we 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 of course have or we have at least two nervous system one is a central nervous system in our head and another called autonomic nervous system which is basically in our body and every body organ 
has its own way of controlling whatever is happening there. Let's say heart has several different systems which are kind of almost like independent from each other, controlling the heart rhythm, but they are communicating with each other. And there is a communication, some with our central nervous system, but primarily most of the control happens inside of the heart. Or our guts, they have their own autonomic nervous system, which is very even different from the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, which we know about. Uh, but neural therapy kind of, uh, the idea, it deals with this autonomic nervous system, which controls all the functions in our body, including, including our emotions. And what's happening with us when we go through life, inevitably, all of us, uh, we have certain uh, stresses, we have certain uh, traumatic experiences. And how we respond to those experiences is different. Some people kind of look at them, they, 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 uh, they process that, and they let it go. And some people kind of don't want to know what happened with them, and they repress their emotions, but meaning they store them somewhere, this energy, because this is energy, they store it somewhere in our body, or they suppress emotions, meaning they, they are aware that they, let's say, they don't want to talk to their spouse, but, but, but they're trying to avoid it in all kinds of ways, it's called suppression. So once again, it gets stored somewhere in our body. Or let's say a woman was uh, uh, raped or molested. So basically, those emotions are being stored usually in the pelvic area. So the body developed these storing places. And what's, what's interesting that every energetic organ, according to Chinese, and they no notice it 5,000 years ago, every energetic organ, which, which correspond mostly to the physical organ, stores a particular set of emotions. Let's say liver stores emotions of frustration, anger, or stomach stores emotions of anxiety, fear. So, so basically, Using muscle testing, and you know well about muscle testing, we can talk about it a little bit. Using muscle testing or some other techniques, we can find where emotions are stored. There is a tables of, of, of what particular emotions every organ is stored, is storing. And, and basically we can see muscle testing. Yes. Okay. Am I too far? Well, can you give uh, where people can find that information, like where the emotions are stored in different organs? Do you know? Yeah, I have a table. I, I recently, for example, I, I uh, so so I I took these courses with Dietrich Klinghart, but recently I I found this by um, Bradley Nelson, who has this. A book called Emotional Code. Mm -hmm. So he also identified very similar kind of uh, table of emotions. It's much uh, smaller than what I'm using. And if you like, later on I can show where and which organ stores what what emotions. Yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with the book. So it's Brad, Bradley Nelson's Emotion Code. They also, right. uh, that book is kind of nice because it also teaches people how to do the sway test, um, which is a rough, you know, way to do some energy testing. It's a good book for, for things, but I, I forgot that it had a table of where the emotions are stored. It does. It's, it's a pretty simple, oh, okay. uh, a pretty simple table. And because I read it just uh, recently, you know, he talks about using magnets, and this is one of the mm -hmm. magnets. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, my my staple got attached to that. <laughs> so it's a magnet, and he shows very simple way how to resolve the emotions using the mm -hmm. magnets. Kind of like, uh, so it, it, it's an interesting uh, ap approach. 
kind of, I think I'm using a bit more advanced method of that. So the body stores those emotions. Let me give you an example because it's just a patient which uh, just uh, came uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Very interesting young fellow. He's uh, 22, one of co-owners of the store. Mm -hmm. And this fellow is an interesting one. So at the age of six months, he was given vaccination and uh, and he became unconscious. He fell into coma for several weeks. Wow. But his parents were kind of very, very conventional people. So at the age of six, they brought him for another vaccination. And once again, he fell into coma for another few days. He later explained to me that at the age of 12, they uh, brought him to pediatrician office who wanted to give him vaccination again. And he began to fight this nurse. So they called four nurses required to, to get this guy and they gave him vaccination again. Mm. He lost all his hair. hair. He developed uh, several autoimmune conditions. Uh, the kids in school, of course, been, uh, bullying him, you know, 12 years old. It's, uh, somebody lost his hair. So he could not even go to school or have normal relationships. And so he became extremely angry. So he came to me asking to help him with his anger and frustration, telling that he is a good guy. But he feels like healing people around him because it's difficult and he doesn't know how to interact with people. So by doing just simple muscle testing, right away I found two places on, on his, on his, uh, shoulders where the vaccinations were given. Mm -hmm. Give him simple injections with procaine. What is procaine? It's a local anesthetic which, uh, which dentists quite often use. It, sh it works for a short time. So I gave him this very short injection, just uh, one cc in each arm. It was very painful. And he began, the rage just came. He was just became so rageful, you know. He was began to, began to scream. You know, it was, it was, I mean. I given those injections many times, you know, that was clearly over the board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I calmed him down and then I gave him some additional. I knew that his, his frustration and anger in, in his liver. So I gave him some injections there. And then I found out uh, that on his right side, uh, there is a, this stellate ganglia, gave him a little bit there. And I stepped back. And he was asleep. He was asleep. He fell asleep. <laughs> this, well, did you guy, actually, to... did you actually gave the injection in the liver or just a liver meridian? No, no, it's uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the injections. Yes. It's a, uh, it, uh, it, it's a subcutaneous injection. So it's a very, very, very safe. It's under the skin. Uh -huh. Under the skin, you give a little bit of 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 this uh, procaine, maybe 0. 0.5 cc. So it's a very easy to do. It's very safe. Side effects are extremely, extremely rare. So it's a very safe method. And you can find the point where inject because because it, even if you take your hand, you can feel where the where, where your fingers get stuck. So, so it is so-called interference here. Oh, okay. And then kind of you push a little bit there. Uh -huh. So basically this fellow just fall asleep. He was, I mean, after half an hour, I came to him. I saw that he's unconscious. I got scared. <laughs> <laughs> I had to wake him up. Uh -huh. I called him next day and he told, I felt so calm next day, you know. It was so unusual for him to feel that way. So actually, I think it was on Wednesday, he came again. And, and, and this time when I gave him these injections, once again, this anger came, mm -hmm. but much less, much less. And then the story, which I told you when he was 12 years old, he recounted this story. 
about what happened to him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's kind of, uh, I mean, his reaction, of course, is very, very strong, but, but, uh, but I do see those reactions very often. It's interesting that this particular patient reacted by kind of a release, a release of the energy, you know? Yes. Of the anger. And I, I just wonder if that's a universal principle because I find that when I'm doing energy work for anything, like you're doing even the gentlest kind of energy work for trauma, if you were to muscle test it or energy test things, there's always a release of some kind, like a detox of some kind, you know, emotionally right. or fit or in terms of toxins that accumulate in the body. What do you think about that? Because yeah. I absolutely 100% agree with that. Oh, really? It's basically, it's all, we all are energy. You know, if you know about uh, nuclear physics, you know, there is nothing here to see. It's, it's emptiness. Mm -hmm. However, we, we, we see what we see. So, but it's all energy. It's just being released. And if this energy is stored, it clearly in this repressed, uh, suppressed emotions, whatever negative stuff, it, it causes emotional and physical issue. So to me, our goal is to help people to resolve it. And with that, you can help them to resolve their physical and emotional issues, help them to become more happier mm -hmm. people. Yeah. I have a question for you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have an individual who... You know, I work with, with energy work and she's on a lot of different supplements and things like that. But her problem, I think, and I've been working on that as well, is that she has problems with the genetics and the enzymatic metabolic process of detoxification. So let's just assume the energy testing is accurate and she mm -hmm. has problems with the ability to create sufficient amounts of glutathione. Okay. Right. She also has uh, other problems. She was like in, in utero, she was exposed to Lyme. And so she was born with Lyme and it had mm -hmm. a really prolonged and harmful effect on her. But one of the things that I've noticed is that like, let's say if we work on trauma or we work on, you know, helping he her heal with anything, she always has a detox effect and it always is felt as a very difficult process. So it doesn't matter how you do it. But in terms of people who have problems with detoxification, what are your thoughts about novel ways to help them detox more gently so that they don't suffer so much? So, so, you know, like every method has its uh, limitations. So, so it's, uh, and, uh, Neurotherapy as well. We would need to examine her. We can give some series of injections, let's say for around the liver area, which, which then uh, corresponds with autonomic nervous system, which controls the liver. And that may in some way improve. So literally, like you could provide kind of an anesthetic effect with the detox and maybe decrease the problem. Yeah. Okay. So let me step back a little okay. bit. What neurotherapy does and how it works. So basically, uh, the way it works that basically it, it, it produces the short, uh, reset of the autonomic nervous system function and short reset of communication between the autonomic nervous system and central nervous system. And the endocrine system. Okay. It's like if our computer got frozen. So what we do, we reset the computer, hoping that after that it will start working again. And quite often it does. So the same principle is here. It helps to reset and return the communication, which is supposed to be normal, kind of going up and down. I mean, autonomic nervous system sends 80% of the communication to that central nervous system or, or, or when it communicates with that central nervous system, 80% of communication goes from the 
autonomic nervous system to central nervous system. And central nervous system sends about only 20% of information. For example, you cannot tell your heart. It's very difficult if you know how to meditate, how to beat slower or, or how to beat more fast because it is under control of the autonomic nervous system in the heart. However, if we have a negative emotions and we become anxious, you know, so we develop palpitations. Or if we run fast, so, so the heart begins to beat. So there is a communication in the body. When this communication gets disturbed, then we get into problems. So with this particular patient, of course, you know, it's a, it's a complicated case. So where it can help, it may be able to help some of the, some of the issues with the, uh, regulation of the liver. Mm. But of course, there is a, a, a big place will play all kind of, um, supplements. Uh, if she had, uh, intrauterine, you, intra, uterine lime and I do see those patients so they respond well this is another method that I do they respond well to IV therapy intravenous therapy with uh, um, with ozone and uh, ultraviolet blood irradiation I can explain more about it but mm-hmm. uh, that's another method that can be very helpful yeah I'm uh, listening to you and trying to figure out ways without Having to inject anything. <laughs> Listen, I would love to invite you to show you. It's, uh, there are some mm-hmm. very, very simple uh, methods of in- injection. Okay. For example, I, mean, I just mentioned major autochemolytic therapy. Uh, meaning, uh, uh, big uh, uh, auto meaning itself, chemolytic is uh, blood. So the method consists of and it's an old, old, old method, probably 100 years old. It consists of taking some blood from, from the vein, injecting this blood in the back with a normal saline solution, and adding the ozone. Ozone is a very active form of oxygen. It's a three atoms of oxygen together, which doesn't stay long for, which stays together for a very short time. So it has a lot of energy. You mix it together well, and then it goes back into the patient vein, and it passes through a little machine which irradiates ultraviolet light. And that is energy. This is this is your own stuff. So there is no no possibility for allergic reaction. And this is this is your own body begins to react and help you to resolve a lot of uh, autoimmune issues and infection issues. Yeah, I actually, this very patient was introduced to a doctor who does this very thing. And she okay. just tried wow. it this past week. Uh, I think he called it auto chemotherapy. Yeah, you can, you can call it. Uh, something that you can do if you don't have all the equipment mm-hmm. and this another method called minor autochemolytic therapy. Minor meaning small. Uh, so that basically, and this is an old method. I remember it was used on my mother. On, I have seen it being back in Soviet mm-hmm. Union. Mm-hmm. It's basically taking a little bit uh, of uh, blood from the vein, about uh, 1 to 10 cc, and injecting it back into your buttock or more elegant along the spine. Uh, there is a so-called blood meridian, which is acupuncture meridian, and it connects with all other acupuncture meridians. And that, once again, it helps body to restore its normal ability to communicate and to resolve a lot of different autoimmune issues. Yeah, I think... Um, autoimmune issues is something that's come to my attention as I've developed as a holistic psychiatrist because there's so many different ways in which the immune system can get a little bit confused um, as to what is self and what is non-self, you know, over the course of 
so much exposure, especially to medications and things like that. So, right, right, yeah. right. Absolutely. This is, and it's a, it's a, it's a simple, elegant uh, method. It helps with a lot of in, infections. Nowadays, it's a very important one because, because we had the COVID epidemic mm -hmm. and many people have a uh, long COVID. And so basically for a number of people, I did this um, major auto chemolytic therapy for some minor auto chemolytic therapy. And that does help to resolve those long standing COVID, which is, um, I'm sure you have seen also uh, patients who have significant uh, psychiatric issues because of that. Right. Yeah. Which really helps people to understand that psychiatric issues isn't just, you know, in the ether somewhere, that there is a connection between inflammation and our psychological and emotional state. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. So with this uh, trauma resolution therapy using the procaine or do you use lidocaine? Novocaine. Novocaine? Okay. It's uh, the same thing, okay. procaine or novocaine. It's, uh, one is brand new. So using that, uh, do you use that on all your patients with trauma or do you have some other favorite techniques you like to use to help with trauma resolution? What's interesting with this method, I kind of, it's more, more, more involved. So neural therapy is a component of that. Mm -hmm. But I'm a psychiatrist at heart. So, so basically one of the things that, uh, let's say when I'm next to the patients, I'm in the field of patients and I'm doing my muscle testing and I do it, uh, I don't, uh, I don't do it with patient hand. Mm -hmm. I kind of uh, do it with my, Mm -hmm. finger Me too. I can feel it. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so so this is much easier uh, and it requires for me or and uh, for you I'm sure to be in the patient field so when you're in the patient field and you cannot think about what's happening at home yes. or whatever bills are not paid mm -hmm. because then you lost it yeah yeah <laughs> so you're completely in the patient field and when you're in the patient field, you become sort of a mind reader. And so, so when I'm there, I can do a number of things, uh, or it, uh, kind of my intuition sort of, uh, guides me there because it's uh, stop being me. And I become kind of not me, but I become a healer. That's my, that's my role. So, so I can do EMDR. Uh, and without without asking patient to rotate their eyes, I can do that. But it's much easier ask patient to close their eyes and kind of do the tapping back forth while they're focusing on the negative stuff. Mm -hmm. Or I can do just straight. I kind of I know a little bit about the patients. I identify what emotion they have. Uh, they're in this, um, in this very relaxed state. It can be all, even, even without neural therapy. There are some people who don't want needle, <laughs> you know, so fine, mm -hmm. you know, I can do without it. So, so when I'm in this field, I feel what, what's going on. So I can guide them. I can, uh, guide them to, let's say, talk to their father, uh, with whom they had a difficult, a relationship and I can guide them how to talk for the father for themselves and tell father what they think of him or what happened and they can talk from the father's perspective and then that helps people to develop this understanding of what's happening and release their emotions and of course after that you know after the meeting I always kind of give people some writing assignments or some uh, do some creative assignments. Uh, some people like to write poetry. I have uh, one patient who was uh, writing songs. You know, every time she comes to me, she she sings. It's a so she would create the poetry and the melody. There are some people who like to uh, make pictures, beautiful pictures. You know, and they express themselves. 
And then I would take a picture and let's talk about it. What does it mean? And as they begin to look at the picture, kind of a lot of stuff comes out. Mm-hmm. So my goal is to help them to release this energy, which is blocking them in their life. So there's so many different ways that we can uh, release these pent up energies. Um, for some, they just transmute it into these different creative outlets. And um, yeah. I think that's a wonderful way to work with people as well. Sounds like a lot of fun, you know, to work with patients like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why, that's why I don't want to retire. I love what I do. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and that's fun. And, and my goodness, money is, uh, I mean, it's, it's good that I'm being paid for my fun. <laughs> 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 I know. Today I was working with a patient and I just felt very happy inside to be able to work with that individual because uh, there's yeah. a good fit, you know, between what I'm trying to offer, what she's w- willing to receive, not, lots of resonance. It's it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of reward yeah. uh, with working with people like that. Um, I guess one of the important questions is uh, what are some precautions or limitations to this uh, very uh, interesting and effective uh, approach that you've described, this uh, trauma resolution therapy. Are there some precautions or limitations in general that you want us to be aware of? Yeah, so so listen, if we drink too much water, you know, we can also have the issues. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, uh, what's what's good, uh, so, so basically, uh, people who, let's say, who uh, who have difficulty with with injections, so let's say they take a blood sinus, so they may start bleeding. So I need to be very careful or avoid it completely. Uh, so that would be one contraindication. So another one, if uh, somebody has a, um, and it's quite rare. If somebody has an allergy to the procaine, oh, okay. uh, and uh, procaine is a local anesthetic, so it 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 uh, basically it disintegrates not in the liver or kidney, but right there in the tissue. And the short life is pretty short; it's about it's about uh, twenty minutes. So. So within uh, 20 minutes, uh, you know, I finish and people rest a little bit and, and, and everything is okay. If I do some uh, deeper injections, so I would ask them to, to wait until they are ready for a longer time. Ganglion injection puts uh, people in this relaxed state of mind. So, so it may take 20 minutes to get out mm-hmm. of it. But some people like to just, and I have a number of those, you know, I, I usually put them as my last patients of the day. And they would stay in my office for additional hour while I'm kind of doing my notes or whatever, finishing up. And they have a chance to relax. Or if I know that they're going to need additional time, so I have some, some, some office space in another room, I put them there. So those are most common issues as any as you do any needle you can you can needle something which is wrong you know it's um it it rarely happens but if you are inexperienced you know i mean that's why uh, we try to give uh, those people who are interested in that try to give them uh, training how to do that and i myself had to get through a lot of training so so until i kind of felt confident. Yeah, because you're trained in acupuncture. So you've worked with a lot of needles. I think right. I would say patients should avoid me and needles. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I should be going at anyone with a needle. <laughs> okay. But with the amount of training that you've had, I think that it makes you more much more comfortable with uh, injections and needles and things like that. When I was a kid and my mother was a uh, Surgeon. Mm-hmm. So, so, so I, I remember in first grade, I would commute in a bus across the whole our town to her office and she'll put me somewhere 
in the corner of the office and she would operate, do all, all her stuff, you know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I would kind of look at it. So, so I always had an interest in that. Oh my gosh, of course. Uh huh. Okay. So, Very you know. early introduction to, um, yeah. you know, sewing <laughs> on a human body. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, surgeons. Oh, wonderful. Well, I think this covers a lot of the topics that I, I wanted to cover. There is one curious um, question that I had, and it is that I'm, I'm aware that you're the only psychiatrist in the entire United States who knows about neurotherapy and can do this work. So my question to you is why, if it's so popular, well, why is it, if it's so effective, that this approach has not kind of become much more popular among, uh, let's say, psychiatrists or other people? Applying uh, um, neurotherapy to psychiatry is kind of very new. Okay. So, uh, number one, that neurotherapy entered United States only in the late 1990s. My mentor, Dietrich Klinghardt, who was trained in neurotherapy in Germany. Mm -hmm. He is a very charismatic fellow. He brought it here. We established Neurotherapy Association just in 2018. Mm. I'm, kind of, I'm one of the founders of this association. Wonderful. So we actually, if somebody from psychiatrists are listening to that, we're going to have a meeting in Seattle, uh, starting April, uh, April, uh, 2nd. So if they're interested, please contact me. I'll tell you how to get it there. Uh, I, I published a couple of articles, you know, but, uh, um, but my research is still considered to be anecdotal because it's, uh, you know, it's a small, I didn't use any scales, kind of my, my response, what and how it works. Uh, what's interesting, what's, what's interesting, which I discovered, let's say these highly complicated conditions, um, which conventional psychiatrist doesn't, doesn't do well is anorexia and bulimia. It's a condition from which people die most frequently, uh, anorexia. And, and actually it's a very easy to resolve using neurotherapy. Wow. And I, Published a little article about it. It does require just a, uh, two, three times injections and then maybe some maintenance later on. But quite a few people don't even require that because those people with anorexia or bulimia, they keep their, hold their trauma in the area of stomach and the, and the, and the sternum. You say they hold their what? They hold their what? They hold their trauma. Oh, okay. Or, 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 or they need to continue with this behavior somewhere in this area. I see. So by releasing the energy from this area, they get well. Mm. Which is, uh, I didn't have that many cases, but, but all of them got uh, resolved. Hmm. When they release the energy from that area, do they feel something or does something physical happen? Something, something shifts in their mind. Oh, okay. You know, it's, it, it just, it's just amazing. Mm. Something shifts in their mind that, uh, that they no longer kind of want to go and uh, do what they've been doing. They, <laughs> one case kind of failed. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was this lady, she was about close to 50 years old, uh, being taken care by her parents who are in there, uh, close to 80 years old. And she had this anorexia for, I, I don't know, for 20 plus years. Wow. Uh, she came from the hospital, uh, was just hospitalized there because electrolytes were all, all over. So she came there and I began to give her an injections and uh, she felt better and then she refused to come. So what happened? She began to gain weight. 
<laughs> and uh, so, so kind of, I did it a couple of times, but it was such an embedded case. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm sure if she would, if she would continue, I probably would be able to help her. But, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, she refused to come. But. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that. That, that takes a lot of courage for you to just share a case that wasn't, you know, like over the top miraculous. So I appreciate your openness to sharing that story mm-hmm. with me. Well, I really appreciate your time. Um, I think we need to wrap up our podcast. Yeah. I want to um, really thank you for all your time, your expertise, your devotion to your patients, uh, the fact that you have traveled all over um, looking for answers for them. Uh, I really appreciate that, that spirit, that unselfish spirit that um, fuels your 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 mind and your curiosity and openness. So I just want to honor you for that and tell you how much I appreciate that there are doctors like you uh, in the U.S. and in the world uh, who devote so much of their time and energy to helping others. So thank you so mm. much. Thank you. Thank you for interviewing and thank you for your great work. Oh, well, thank you so much for saying that. For those people who want to um, find out a little bit more about Dr. Michael Gurevich, who I respect and, and really uh, admire in his work, this, his holistic practice obviously is, is very unique to his expertise. He is a certified acupuncturist on top of everything else. You can find out more about him on his website, holisticmd.org. Again, holisticmd.org. And so you can go there and, and learn more about his work and uh, schedule appointments to see him if you like. He, he works in New York, Long Island for the last 20 years. And um, I think that you'll be very happy with uh, his uh, many years of expertise in holistic psychiatry. So thank you for listening to our podcast on uh, trauma resolution therapy and being introduced to neurotherapy through Dr. Michael Gurvich. If you like what you've heard, uh, please subscribe to this podcast for more helpful information and give this podcast a positive rating. I hope you'll subscribe to my website, holisticpsychiatrist.com, where you'll find more wonderful articles, podcasts, and links to all my social media platforms. If you wish to integrate high-quality nutritional supplements from reputable sources and support my holistic psychiatry practice, uh, please register for Fullscript's free online dispensary that helps keep you supplied with the industry's largest catalog of professional-grade supplements available on my website under the Products tab. I look forward to sharing more insights with you through podcasts and articles and hope you'll thrive as you build your life from the thought up. Uh, Thank you for listening and bye-bye. The content provided by this podcast is for informational purposes only and has not been approved by the U.S. FDA. This podcast is not intended to provide personal medical advice, which should be obtained from a medical professional. An ironic media production. Visit us at ironic media.com.